Hello world, welcome back to another NC State Libraries stream. My name is Colin Keenan, I'm a staff member with the NC State Libraries. I'm here with Mitchell, a student worker from our VR studio. And today we're going to be exploring holograms and machine generated imagery. Uh, we have a really cool piece of equipment with us. You can see it in the bottom corner of the screen here. Mitchell, move it around a bit. This is a 3D display uh, that renders true 3D uh, rather than the Pepper's Ghost Illusion that you might be familiar with from amusement park rides or where el wherever else you've seen like pseudo holograms. Um, this is a true 3D display. We're going to take it through its paces today over the next hour and a half, uh, generate some, some art purely made by in collaboration with robots and machine learning. Um, then Mitchell's going to take over and do a little bit of uh, blender work, and we're going to show all of this within the 3D display today to kind of give you a, a sense of what's possible with volumetric media. Um, this display that we're looking at, the Looking Glass uh, Portrait, is soon to arrive in tech lending here at the libraries as well. Uh, so you'll be able to check these out and bring them home to play with. Um, but they're already available within the virtual reality studio here at D.H. Hill Junior Library. Um, so we would love to see anybody interested in the stream today or who's uh, into what they're seeing us work on uh, to come up and join us in the VR studio and work on some of these similar topics and equipment. Um, I think we should just kind of get cracking, huh? Yeah, start sounds right. So you see I have a blender uh, up in the background behind us here just to kind of walk you around what you're seeing on screen. Uh, obviously we have our chat here so if anyone has any thoughts or uh, suggestions on what we could be making over the course of our stream today, uh, jump, jump in the chat, give us some ideas. Um, I'm gonna, I'll just open up the conversation right now. We're gonna be telling a robot what to draw for us. So if anyone has anything they would like to see a computer or a robot draw for us. Throw some suggestions for prompts we can give to our to our friendly robot, um, and we'll get it started. Um, I think that's probably a pretty good place to start with some machine generated imagery. Um, so I have been uh, really fascinated. Let's change what screen we're showing you here. There we go. I've been really into Hillel Wayne's uh, art machine, which is a Google Colab um, project. So let's give a shout out to Hillel here. I think he's a pretty amazing coder. Um, so let's see the art machine. Uh, so this is a project that is through Google Colab. It's a open collab notebook um, whereby you can enter a text prompt and have AI generated art. Um, it's based off of GANs and I think QGAN uh, specifically. So the history of QGAN is pretty interesting and I, I think uh, Catherine Crossan has a big hand in the, uh, the making of QGAN. Um, so there, it's definitely standing on the, the shoulders of lots of work by other community members. I'll just kind of point out I think Hillel does a pretty good job of pointing out some of the predecessor uh, GANs like VQ GAN and uh, or other, you know, this is not kind of cut from whole cloth. But so if you've never worked with Google Collab yet, uh, we're going to connect to the server. So we're utilizing cloud based RAM and GPU. And here's the time that we can enter our prompt. Do you have a favorite piece of uh, of artwork, a favorite piece of painted artwork, anything like that. We can use that to influence uh, mm. the work of the of the GAN. I mean, I like Monet paintings, okay. but I don't know if it's about a specific piece. Yeah, let's go into Wiki Commons. There's that one piece that I think he did, or someone, some impressionist did, of like uh, ships on the water in the morning. I like that one. Ah. Fishing boats leaving the harbor? Uh, that's close enough. Yeah, let's, let's go with that. So this is a public domain image um, that we're going to utilize, obviously. Shout out to Claude. Um, and I'm going to grab the image link. 
So here's some stuff that I don't really think our audience has to care too much about. I'm going to render a 540 um, pixel image uh, using 400 machine steps. And we're going to get a report on what's going on every 25 steps. We'll influence it with that image. And here's what do we want to draw today. I mean, you pick a word and I pick a word. OK. And then um, we'll combine them. I got my mine in my head. Does it have to, we're trying to like combine it with the image? No. OK. No rules. Ball. 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 Uh, mine was wolf pack. So wolf pack playing with ball. Wolf ball. Wolf ball. <laughs> uh, OK, so we're going to tell that to fire away. We got some more um, sliders and stuff. I really, I would encourage anybody uh, who's interested today who's watching, I'm going to throw a link in the chat here. This is like an incredible project. I've been using it all the time in my own work, um, just as like a jumping off point for different models I've been making and stuff. I think this is like one of the coolest things I found last year. Um, so I'm going to do runtime, run all. Boom. OK, so that's going to be puttering away in the background. Uh, we can check back in on that. Remind me every now and then, Mitchell, to sh show what's happening with our what our robot's making. Will do. And then I think it's time for us to jump into looking at Looking Glass a little bit. Um, let's go elsewhere. I just want to kind of show, um, show off what exactly we're talking about here. So this is Looking Glass, the company that makes the Looking Glass portrait. Uh, we've been really enamored with the equipment they've been making a while, for a while because like 3D media is cool and virtual reality is cool because it gives you the opportunity to interact with 3D media in a natural way. But putting a headset on doesn't always, isn't always particularly cool yeah. and there, it's very isolating in some ways or it can be if you're not planning for um, other countermeasures. But 3D displays, you could have 15, 20 people standing around and all participating with the 3D monitor. Um, obviously, this is um, put your hand maybe against the display just to give people a frame of reference. Yeah, this is like a eight inch display or something. Eight, maybe it's nine and a half inch corner to corner or something. Yeah, there you go. Um, so this is very small. This is like a personal display, personal kind of portrait um, frame. Um, probably should um, title our stream a little bit better. I'm going to do that right now. Um, completely lost my train of thought as I do this, but um, so oh freaky! I'm showing our stream on stream. <laughs> uh, I forget what this stream is supposed to be called, so I'm going to rename it. Um, what do you say? Uh, art via machines, holograms, beautiful art in three different directions. Dimensions? Dimensions is the word I was looking for there. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, where I remember I made that Asteroids 3D, 3D game, uh -huh. and I, my tagline for it was a, a extra dimensional take. <laughs> ah, I see what you're doing there. Yeah, so we just changed that stream title. Um, so yeah, this is the Looking Glass portrait. So obviously, this is a display that's going to show what's happening within a 3D editing environment. So like you've got your game engines, or maybe Maya, or SolidWorks that you're used to making 3D content in. We're going to be touching Blender a bit today, which is both of our favorite uh, 3D editor, I think. Um, and But this is a natural ender point for those things to be displayed such that they're not getting two-dimensionalized when they're being shown. Um, so let's, uh, let's open up the Hollow Play Studio and really make this thing do some stuff. I think. I think we can actually make this do that. Okay, cool. 
So you can see we got, you want to turn the turntable just a little bit. We got Hunt Library uh, up and running in there. Kind of, we were kind of happy with how that one looked. Uh, so if we delete that, we can add hologram. Let's show one of their demos. I, I like the frog. The frog is pretty cool. Biggie the cat. I almost drag and dropped in our in our stream there instead of. There we go. You want to show off the frog a little bit? And what's really amazing, I mean, you're looking at this hologram through a camera, and it still remains three dimensional. Um, obviously, 3D is becoming 2D again on our stream. But what as Mitchell turns this, you're Nothing is, the monitor does not know it is being turned. Uh, it does not have accelerometers in that way. So it is by virtue of changing the angle you are viewing this monitor at, different information is presented to you. Which, um, you know, I, I think that has new storytelling possibilities. You could have a spy show where the audience is actually able to look around corners or look for, tr look for clues that the camera isn't pointing at. Um, there's like endless game possibilities and if you can have different people looking at the same screen and seeing different stuff. Oh, if you could merge it with eye tracking technology, that's been a big thing recently, it'd be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Eye tracking, hand tracking, which we do have sensors for in the VR studio if you're interested in any sort of body tracking. Um, yeah, so that's obviously why this is also exciting to us. Uh, so we're going to make some of this stuff today, um, make stuff like this little frog. Um, which I think was just generated from a flat image. Uh, so if you own a iPhone 10 or later, there's actually already a built-in capture for 3D images. Um, so you can load right into an object like this. Uh, if you're interested in making stuff here on campus at State, that's a great avenue for that. Um, how does the eye tracking work with these holograms? Yeah, talk more about how you think eye tracking could get applied here. Well, I mean, what it's doing is it's presenting different uh, versions of the image based on the perspective that you're viewing it. And so if you have eye tracking, I mean, currently what eye tracking is being used for in VR, from my understanding, is what's called focal rendering. So in our normal eye, the uh, like fidelity of the image is lower uh, outside of like the foci of what you're looking at. So there's like a little teeny tiny circle like, right in the middle of your vision where stuff is really high res. And then as you move outside of that stuff it becomes more blurry until you get into your peripheral vision. Uh, with eye tracking in VR, you can basically track the spot that you want to focus your rendering power um, in your headset. So you're not having to render the entire display at the full quality. It makes uh, rendering more efficient. And so you could use that same technology to um, uh, see which perspective you're looking at an image and add more depth to it. Yeah, it could essentially uh, replace the turntable as we're using it here, where the you could basically prescribe, I want to show this view and then that view. And you don't need your audience to cooperate with your intention to show them, that they move for you to show them those things. The image will move and remain three-dimensional. Um, pretty powerful. Good question. Thank you. Um, we should check on that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to look at the what the robot's got making. Yeah. Let's see where it's at. Okay. Yeah. I'll show it off to them as well. Uh, Seems like it's taking the interpretation of ball to mean beach ball. <laughs> Here's what we got so far, everybody. So I see, I think that's going to create, that looks landscapey to me. Yeah. Like kind of, yeah, it looks like um, um, Dr. Zivago, if you've ever seen that movie. I don't think I have. Yeah, it so has a lot of long shots of the Siberian tundra. It reminds me of that new Netflix thing, Shadow and Bone, where they have like the land skimming ships. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why it seems like it's not over the ocean here since there's so many people, like figures that seem to be walking along it. Yeah, it's definitely doing the Mo Monet impressionist thing pretty well. I mean, this is what it was kind of being trained on. And you can see where there's elements of the shadowy kind of figures there. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested to see if these are our, our balls that are going to 
the beach ball kind of thing are going to form there. How many iterations did you set it to do? This is only through, oh, this is, wow, this thing is chugging. This is through 375 already. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so this is nearing, it's it's only going to do one more stopping point. So I think uh, I might hand off to you in Blender pretty soon here if what, we already got an image. What do I want to model then? Yeah, so what do you, what do we see when we uh, look at this? I see some building kind of stuff that you could jut out. I, I think we just want something three-dimensional. I see I see an iceberg. Yeah, uh, out, out here? Yeah, right there. I see an iceberg. I can make an iceberg. Yeah, make an iceberg. Maybe give us some depth of field uh, where this is like the fore becoming foreground as it comes close to us. Make like a couple an, ships an or inflection something. point, a horizon basically is here maybe. Something yeah. like that. And then this becomes background. And we can do all that. Well, all that. You talk through this, but I, I envision that happening mostly through sculpting, um, because you could import as as mesh, import plane as mesh, uh, and then you'll get a mesh. This will already have. You could subdivide this to whatever you want it to be and stuff. Mm. But you're the blender guy. I'm gonna let you. So uh, you think you have sculpting this 2D plane into something with more depth? Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah, or um, use it as a material if you want, uh, and stick it on something if it's easier. That to could be interesting. Is I, I actually do have in, uh, some good knowledge of procedural materials. It'd be interesting to see what I could do with uh, a height map and displacement. Well, it's gonna be all you. So I'm gonna save image as. Uh, what do you want me to call this for easy access later? Uh, Monet icebergs. Monet icebergs sounds good. Yeah. And that is in your download file for you. Uh, download folder. I'm gonna swing this back to Blender. Let's switch spots. Switch spots. So you can do a short step. I'm gonna go around. Hi, Billy Ho, streamers. So here we are in Blender. Artist, good Blender artist does in the beginning, and we're going to delete the defaults. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to import in our. What was the file you saved for that? Uh, Monet Icebergs. It's in downloads. Is it just a PNG file? Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. How do I import as a. Uh, it was the menu you just had up. Okay. Import. It's the last option usually. X3D extensible? Nah. Uh, I would just bring it in as. I can just bring in, I can make yeah, a just make it a make it a plane, and then you can subdivide a bunch. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna that must be an add-on I've added. I always forget what what are add-ons and what are default. So um, I, I'm assuming I'm not teaching people how to use Blender. Nah, fly through it. Fly yeah. Through. Okay. So yeah, we have our plane here, and then we're going to go here to get our texture. We're gonna add texture. We're going to open downloads. And give that to this. To do that, we're going to go into our shading tab up here. Uh, your Blender window is super weirdly sized. If you just want to make sure it's on the OBS that it's all showing, I think yeah. a large portion of your screen's cut off. Does that look good? Uh, people see. Yeah. Just, oh, I, I see what I see. What you can do. Like it, it's this is all cut off. Well, yeah, you can do it up here by just resizing the red right box. It'll be way easier for you. Can I it's in the mod. Yeah, exactly what you're going to do. Yeah, see, so you can shrink it and make it scale better. See how you don't have your bottom right corner of your Blender screen? Exactly. Okay, we're going to do that. So now I can close down a little bit, raise this up a little bit. Okay. So, I'm going to add a new material to this plane. It's going to pop up a uh, principal BSDF shader. All we're going to do is we're going to add an image texture, uh, go into our image our textures. We already added in the uh, Monet icebergs. We're going to add that into our base color, and now it should show up here. So this is just important texture. Uh, I'm going to rotate this along the x-axis so we can get it facing right up. And then I'm going to try and see if I can do it without sculpting first. So that seems like it'd be more interesting. And then if I need to sculpt afterwards, I can. So we're going to take this thing here, we're going to take the color of it, we're going to run that through a color ramp node, if I can make a node. Oh. Alright, so making a color ramp node, what this is going to do is I'm going to run the uh, color in through this, 
that's going to output uh, a color. I'll run it through here for the moment. It's going to basically just turn it black and white, and then I can increase the darkness values where I want them. So I can make the darker values more dark or the lighter values less white. Uh, as I move the slider around, right now I'm just going to go for an equal distribution. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this color ramp version of this, if I can delete this. Move the color here and leave the color there. And I'm going to use a um, bump node to convert this into, well, actually, I'm going to do a displacement node. I'm going to follow this color, which height map information. So basically, what I'm doing here is I'm messing with the texture. Um, so that black and white texture that I showed earlier is can be uh, construed as a height map or read as a height map by this displacement node. So I'm going to plug it into the height and then that's going to tell it basically uh, the more black or white it is, uh, the lower or higher it is. So now you'll see it's all bumpy uh, because it has different values. And so if I play around with the color ramp here and make certain values darker or lighter, you'll see how some of the bumps kind of fade away um, as we go deeper into it. And I can also scale this up so I can make it like three times as bumpy or whatever I would like. There we go. That gives it a very like painterly look, don't you think? Yeah, totally. It feels like we're seeing brush strokes. Yeah. Um, but I think that's not exactly what we're going for. So let me get rid of this, get rid of this. Let's go back to having that. We'll go back to modeling here. Open up my material preview so I can see what I'm doing. Then I'm going to hit A, and I'm going to go to add a modifier. I'm going to subdivide this. Um, simple subdivisions, and I'm going to up that to six subdivisions. I'm going to apply. Can I mess with one OBS thing quick? Sure. Just because I think it'll look better for the audience. I'm just going to take the mouse as well. So you'll see here on the mesh that I have is that it's very subdivided. There's a bunch of little squares on it, and that means that there's all those points I can move independently, and so I should be able to um, more smoothly uh, interface with the mesh. Before, it was just four points, one in each corner of the uh, thing. So now there will be a lot more to actually move around with. Yeah. All right. Now we'll move into sculpting mode up here at the top. Move back into our material preview so you can see what we're doing. And then we're going to get into our sculpting. So some basic uh, brushes that we have here are the draw brush. So what this will do, you'll see, is it'll pop out uh, some of the geometry. So if I look here, it's popping that out. So I can just kind of go here the pieces that I feel like should be out. I'll do that. And then I can hold down Shift on any brush uh, to smooth while I'm using it. There's technically a smooth brush right here, but it's easier just to hold shift. And then you could do a control to invert. So if I'm drawing here, that's pulling out uh, this big geometry, but then if I do control, it's going to dig in. Uh, it's going to do the opposite. So I can use a combination of smoothing, the opposite of what I'm doing, and that to kind of get a good basic uh, framework for sculpting. So I'll add a little bit of a uh, big piece here, kind of try and follow the contours of whatever shape this is. Smooth it out some. And I can kind of play around with some other things, like we have uh, clay strips here. This is nice for um, adding some more finer detail or blockier detail. Here, I'm kind of adding in the foreground, making this foreground pop out more, giving it a nice smooth uh, texture to it. kind of thinking I want to have each figure pop out a little bit. So what I'm going to do here is try to add a little bit of mesh pop out uh, to each figure. And do that, I'm going to use the F key to resize. So as I move towards my cursor towards the center, this is going to get smaller. And I can click to confirm. And then I'm going to go back to my draw and add a little bit of mesh along each of these figures here. 
There's a hotkey I didn't know. I didn't know that F worked that way. Yeah, I need to do Shift F to do your strength. So hmm. if I want, so right now it's about 0.5. And mm -hmm. if I do Shift F, it'll pull up this thing and it'll show me how strong. So if I want to like okay. basically pull something when I click on it almost all the way out that it can go, I want it at one. But if I want it at 0.5, if I like each time I click, it'll pull it out about half the way. Yeah, you're saving me clicks here. My mouse will last longer. Yeah. Blender is all about the hotkeys. It takes a little bit to learn. It's a bit of a learning curve, but once you do get it, it makes it one of the faster um, 3D engines out there to work in. And you can custom assign any hotkey at well, any there's, time. There's so many preferences. You can customize the entire user interface however you want. I've seen people that have just crazy stuff set up on their personal machines. Mm -hmm. There's the occasional heathen that uses light mode, but... I use... Um, Control Shift M is makes an object automatically um, deletes all non manifold parts, which right. I don't know why anyone else would ever want that hotkey, but I use it all the time. It's so funny because it's like simulating forced perspective in certain ways. Like I, I think I see a, a walkway there personally and where right um there. from like dead say yeah yep exactly right yeah there. point to it with the cursor so the right they kind of know what we're talking about yeah exactly i see yeah and i think that gives you an opportunity to kind of react to that with your topology but i love this ai art because it'll like try it'll you know try to do things like forced perspective without knowing it's doing it um i think yeah good jumping off point This is still a nice toolkit to learn for any kind of uh, 3D art you want to do or sculpting. So right here, this is like this little hole here. I'm going to dig into that so that it's a little bit different. Try and isolate this uh, point here where there's a mass. So I kind of have like a peak and valley there. See what I can do to get that even stronger. I'm using control here to dig in, doing the opposite of the draw. And so I'm pulling out this, uh, I want this iceberg to kind of be hanging over a little bit on this ship, so I want it to be pulled out more on the top. And it seems like there's this crease here, so there's actually this handy dandy little uh, brush here called the crease brush. That lets me kind of make a little crease along this line here. It'll pinch the geometry in. Smooth that crease as I make it. There we go. And we have a nice crease running up the uh, side of the thing. We'll kind of try to move that crease into the other geometry there. And then smooth that out. There we go. We'll go back to draw. Control. Kind of try and follow the contours still. And actually, I think that's mostly the uh, just back end of it. If we see here, there's kind of all the contours, but it's not the end of the iceberg. The iceberg kind of has this top section that's backed up a little bit, and we can try to have that still raised out, but not uh, as raised out as this front face section. Right, and so now I, I have this very like smooth edge here. So uh, one another good use of the crease tool, uh, the crease brush here is getting a very defined edge along something. So now I got a very clear edge and smooth and crease again. 
smooth back here and smooth out. You kind of want to smooth when you're smoothing with the crease. You want to smooth either side of the crease. You don't want to smooth in the middle of the crease itself because that'll kind of just undo your crease. Uh, but sometimes you got to get a little frisky with it. All right. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Colin, how's that looking so far? I think it's a really nice start. Yeah. Well, you want to do some of the stuff in the back? I like the subdivide. It seems like the right amount of detail. Yeah. Do you want to explain? Uh, I think this is really interesting. Why, how the subdivide is interacting with your sculpting? Like what, what role it kind of plays? Um, and just like how the subdivision of the mesh is interacting with sculpting. Mm -hmm. So basically, what I'm doing with sculpting is, uh, if I go into edit here, you'll see there's a bunch of these little dots. These are vertices. Um, the basic setup of 3D is you have vertices, which are these little dots. You have edges, which is what's connected to two dots. So if I go into this is edge select mode. Then three is face select mode, and so there are faces. Um, when I'm sculpting, what I'm doing is I'm basically hovering my uh, brush over the vertice, and then the sculpt brush of whatever type it is is telling the vertice what to do. So for draw, it's just saying, okay, whenever I'm hovering over you, pull towards the the, the viewer, whichever way I'm looking, right? It's pull out basically, um, pull out of where you are. And if I hit control, it's going to start digging in. There are other ones here, like uh, this elastic deform will let me just kind of pick and grab and pull stuff. And I can pull these vertices wherever I want them. And it's basically just the vertices that my uh, cursor is hovering over. So if I hit F here, I'll affect a wider range of the vertices, and those will follow that, um, uh, that line. And then there's uh, a lot of special stuff down here for joints and stuff that you will mostly only use if you're doing like an animated character or cloth simulations or something like that. Um, for your basic sculpting, just the general form and shape of something, it's these uh, top uh, brushes up here are mostly what you're going to use. Could you um, select some mesh kind of that correlates to, see like the shadowy figures in like the northwest corner of the plane? This right here? Could you like select their mesh kind of specifically and extrude that to give some sharp uh, contrast of mesh sure. as well? I, I do like the round, big round forms we have so far though too, so they'll work well together. Yeah, just like that. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a circle select, which uh, if you go up here uh, to select modes, uh, the shortcut for this is C, which is what I'm using. But if you go up here to your select modes, you have a select circle, and that just lets you uh, draw with your selection. You just kind of click and drag, and it'll draw it. And then you can use middle click to undo certain parts. So there's a little bit here that I don't want. Here I don't want. And then what I'm going to do is uh, use the E key to extrude this uh, section. So I'm going to hit right click here, now I can see, and I'm going to hit E and extrude that, and that's going to extrude it straight out. You want me to scale it to smooth it out a little, a little uh, bit? Whatever, to taste, really. I, I think that effect looks good, though. If you do that in a couple spots, it'll work well with the hardware. I should be able to just smooth it a little bit. Yeah. Like that. Oh, that's very nice. You can probably go more extreme with the extrude and then smooth it down, yeah, too. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like Mesa-style shelf. Yeah, I think if you go go through and do that in four or five little spots, it's going to... Maybe on basic... I could just smooth out this whole section and yep. do it down here. I've been trying to do these very harder to get the fine details, but this will make it easier. Uh, Ian Boyd always says this about sculpting, that like it's something, you, digital sculpting, you can only do in, in passes and in iterations, that yeah. you like have to make things too, kind of too hard a feature and then smooth it, smooth it, smooth it. Yeah, there's uh, plenty of time lapse, especially if you're doing anything anatomical, where you'll see basically the 3D artist adding a bunch of musculature, it's like, wow, that looks just like it, and then they'll, that's like the first pass, and they'll do like at least 15 other passes. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, why, why are you doing this 15 times? It's because they're going through and trying to get just right. Because they're, well, they're good. Because yeah, they're good, they know what they're doing. Um, I watch videos of people making chairs and stuff, and it's like the first 10 minutes of a 60 minute video, I'm like, oh, you're done, you're, that's it, that's, that's a chair. Right. Nope. Not wanting to have any like lone vertices like this guy up here um, because that won't extrude, that'll just extrude an edge and that doesn't really have any amount of volume to it. So we want to have faces that are fully selected when we're extruding. 
We don't want any hanging uh, loose edges like this one up here. So I'm just going to keep going through this. Uh, and any other questions you have about sculpting column? Hmm. I think we're doing a pretty good cover of it here. I think this is also going to work out to be a very nice little thing to display in the hologram. It's up to you if uh, I'm going to look up the details on the Blender add-on for Portrait. It might just be easier to do this within the editor. Oh, it is. I think it is. Yeah, I'll look that up. So it might be right in the add-on store. I believe it is. If not, it's pretty easy to add on. I've done it on the um, VR Studio computer before. Cool. Let's make that our plan rather than trying to export this and deal with it. What's your Blender history, Mitchell? Seems uh, I started Blender. I got it as a present for my brother-in-law um, back when I was really young. Uh, I was like in, I think, early high school, late middle school, that area era. Uh, he got me basically, I was interested in making games, but I'm still interested in making games. For a while there in high school, I didn't think I would end up making games. And then I got to college and found out that it's a much more achievable career path than I thought. Um, but I really didn't start with Blender until um, late high school when I was kind of out of the idea of making games with it and I just was bored and wanted to do something for fun and so I messed around with some 3D scenes and got a start on it and then I got to college, uh, found that NCSU had a video game development club uh, and I started using my skills and practicing my 3D art uh, within that and since then I've been using Blender for about five or six years now and uh, it's a super useful tool. I have uh, I actually got my job uh, through the library with it. I initially, let's see, I was in the club, and then one of the club uh, officers at the time uh, posted a job that Colin was looking for a 3D modeler. I, there we go. Colin <laughs> um, was looking for a 3D modeler for his uh, VR plants research team. And so I signed up for that. Uh, I got the job, and I've been working with him pretty much ever since after the research uh, grant for that ran out, or the my time on the grant ran out. I've been working in the NCSU VR studio at the DHL library. Blender is one of those skill sets where everyone's going to be looking for it. They just don't know yet. Yeah. That over the next ten years, it will not just be games using that. Oh, uh, real time engines are a big thing to, as well. Um, I'm very happy to have been getting experience with things like Unity and Unreal. Um, like I see now the Unreal editor in the most recent version just has an automatic preset for um, <laughs> things like architectural um, uses and things like for construction, just because it's so popular of a use case. All right. It is right in the add-on menu. Um, it is called, and you don't have to do this right, uh, Oh, you just need to have Hollow Play service running in the background is the only thing, um, which I think we do already have, yeah, we already have that running right now. So, all right, so I'm gonna hit E, I'm gonna extrude this out, decent amount, click, and I'll go and tap, tap, tap. Actually, that's not tap, tap, tap. There we go. Now I got a nice smooth thing. I'm gonna try and now that we have that. I'm gonna make sure I go in here. Uh, do you see the top ball? Kind of? Yeah, you're doing exactly what I was about to say. Yeah. Just turn these into huge spheres, I think. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going for. <laughs> a little bit more of a noodle press now. Yeah. I can smooth that. <laughs> Yeah, I, maybe you know how to do this, Mitchell. I don't know how to take a primitive shape and yeah. just add it to a mesh and have it like adopt the UV map relationships. And there's a handy dandy modifier there's Boolean for that. So um, I can I can show you how to use that in a second. We'll, we'll have to switch to another. I'll hide this and then we can do that. Cool. Um, Boolean's super useful. I use that basically every model I make almost. I'm working on, uh, I'm the president of that video game club I mentioned earlier now, uh, a couple years in, and uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, currently I'm working on a game project, and last night I was making a uh, grenade for the project, and I was using the Boolean modifier to basically kind of hollow out cylinders. All right, I think that's a good stopping point for right now. What do you think? I think that's pretty nice. 
uh, if anyone is watching this video in the future uh, and they're interested in video game development or any of these tools, where and when should they uh, where and when should they be in order to meet up with the video game development club? Uh, first thing you want to do is go to bgdc.org. That's our website. Um, and it'll have any up-to-date information if this is like far in the future. Uh, for the recent times though, um, if you're re-watching this within like the next few months or year, uh, we meet in the DHL VR studio on Wednesday nights. Uh, and we also have, um, if you go on our website, you'll find our Discord server and our email listing. And you can get in on that. And yeah, so if you are re watching this really recently, in a couple weeks we're doing um, uh, Global Game Jam at the uh, end of January. We're hosting this year, so I'm excited about that. Currently in talks with uh, Colin and uh, his boss, trying to organize that. Yeah. All right, so I think we're good on the plane here, so let me check into modeling so I can show you how to use the Boolean modifier. Right, let's, let's say we have a cylinder. Oh no, I'm still editing the plane, aren't I? Yes, I am. Let's say we have a cylinder, right, and we want it to be a hollow cylinder, right? We're going to make a cup, um, or just to hollow it out like a ring, right? So we're going to hit Z, make a ring. So what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this, uh, scale it a little bit. So you can see it's a little bit inside, then we're going to scale it along the Z axis so it's taller. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to this. Uh, outside one, we're going to add the Boolean modifier. We're going to make sure that it's set to difference. Uh, we're going to click the object that we want to effectively difference the subtraction here. So we're going to click the object we want to subtract. So if I hide this cylinder here, you'll see now that it is subtracting the overlap space from this mesh. So anywhere that that other cylinder overlapped with this cylinder is now subtracted. Uh, we can do the union. That'll unite anywhere that they're open. So now this is all one object essentially. So there's no Basically, normally you would have like a, this face would be going straight from here to here, uh, and they'd kind of have like faces overlapping, which you don't want because it'll like add jitters and look all janky and stuff. Uh, but now this is this face is only going down to this edge, and then it's it's all one cohesive um, union. And then intersect will do will basically remove everything but the uh, part where they're intersecting. So that's the basically where both of them are touching each other. That's the opposite of a uh, difference. Where is my mouse? There it is. So we want difference for this. All right. So then now that we have that, we can go into object mode and apply it. And so now uh, we don't need that other cylinder. If I hide it, I delete it. Doesn't do anything. If you delete it before you apply the Boolean modifier, though, it will, um, uh, the Boolean modifier will just say, hey, I don't have anything to delete here. And it'll just be the cylinder that it originally was. That's how you use the Boolean modifier. Nice. Maybe, uh, maybe within this stream, we'll do a second one of these generated things, and we can do it in a Boolean way uh, rather than sculpting half or something. Yeah, I can go with we'll the modifiers too. Nice. Uh, let's let's add that hollow play add-on, or I think it's called Looking Glass Factory. Yep. Um, is the name of the add-on. So that's in preferences add-ons. This is how you add Blender add-ons for anyone. Yeah, make sure this is showing up on, how do I on screen. Uh, cover up the, I think, you, oh, that's, it doesn't. It's like a separate window. So oh, this is a streamer mode safety thing. Uh, if you see that drop down beneath the word libraries that says Blender in OBS, beneath the word libraries in the stream, uh, 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 in the red banner at the bottom of the stream, there's a drop down right beneath it. Gosh, why am I so bad at this? Look at the word NC State University libraries. Libraries. Yes. Look down from the word libraries. There's a drop down. Ah. Okay. I bet the second Blender window will be there, or it won't, because Blender is like doing a safety mode thing here. I think that's what's going on. Yeah. It's well, okay. Forget it. it does, it's not that important. We're, we're adding it. Basically, what you do is you go into Edit. The drop down menu. Up here, <laughs> and then there's uh, Preferences, and then inside the Preferences window, there's a thing for add ons. So you just add it. So what's it called? Looking Glass? Looking Glass Factory. <laughs> Is that not true? Uh, we might have to download it from the. Uh, what do you know? What? Uh, I'm actually just gonna copy the link and. I can probably. Uh, 
pretty much tell you what the here's the it's in my URL on my phone if you want to type that in. On Firefox? Yeah. How do I switch this to Firefox? Yeah, exactly that. That's not good. Yeah, you probably just have another Firefox window open. Yeah, so okay, here we go. Hey, right, machine. Uh -huh. All right, so we're going to HTTPS. Touch the screen so it doesn't lock up. What's that? <laughs> On my phone, it, the oh. screen will lock up very soon. Okay, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. I'm like anybody who works in tech. I have uh, draconian permissions on my phone. Yeah. Um. A bit worse than I should be about that, but I I have a couple passwords that I I use currently, and I switch them out every so often. I don't use the fingerprint reader. Yeah, no, I don't use that thing either. Mine, I don't use mine because it's just broken. Mm. <laughs> Even if I wanted to. Even if some like uh, police officer is trying to like make me sign on my phone or something. It does, it <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> I'm sure they'll believe that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, assets. Where do I get the code here? This code. So I think we just use this zip file. Yep. Okay. Save file with this mm -hmm. explorer. Okay. Yeah, it downloads or wherever it's going to put it is fine. I'm, I'm Firefox that. is alien to me. Yep, um, and then there's like a folder that in that gray bar you're highlighting right now. To your one? right. Yeah, to your right. No, like the, oh, the okay, actual folder you, icon will take you to File Explorer I where see. it's at. Yeah. I see, right here. And then it's Which is very handy in my opinion. And then you just right click it to extract it. Let me make sure, yeah, it's the right one. Um, right click it. Extract all is probably what it would do. Yeah. yeah. And then just kind of say yes to, sure. yeah. Put it in the downloads folder. It's going to create, yeah, exactly. There you go. It's just created a new folder in downloads. There we go. And then we're going to go to Blender. We're going to add an add on. Downloads. Alice. Alice G. Uh, what is it in? Which one? If you give me my phone, I can tell you what the actual file name is. Maybe. maybe I just need to do this one, the overall folder. Uh, usually within the extracted folder for a Blender add-on, there's only like one folder or one file that Blender will see as an acceptable thing to uh, import, and right. that's what I usually just, I forget what file format. It might be a dot .blend, I forget. And then it'll throw it in alphabetical order, which is annoying. So you always have to go down and make sure it actually loaded. I don't know what it's called. So I can't quite read from that list. Yeah, I don't think it'll be called that list. Um, no, I don't think it'll be. You're in documents, you're in downloads. Alice G, or Alice LG. I found that. And I just in installed from there. I don't know if there's another. Mm. Oh, you know what you actually can do is install the zip. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been. I forgot. Oh, word to the wise. Anyone who's watching this in the future, you just install the zip. It's like the. Uh oh. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we got near traceback, most recent call. Enable, mod register. Okay. Value error register class is already registered as a subclass of looking glass OT install dependencies. Mm -hmm. That might be fine. It's just not going. Oh, it's not letting you check the box. So. Yeah. We could try uh, exporting it. Yeah, let's just export and do it through Holoplay. Alright, you want this little GLD? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to fly my 
scale, actually. Another thing to note for Blender, let me switch back over to this, is um, in Blender, you want to uh, apply, this control A is the shortcut for this, but there's a little apply menu. Just apply all your transforms before you um, uh, do something, and make sure when you apply your transforms that your object is centered at the origin of the world, the, where all these lines cross. Uh, sometimes it's this little green dot at the origin point. If I did uh, Control A, uh, all transforms, it would set this here, and then this guy would still be all the way over here. And now if I rotate it, it's going to rotate around the origin, and that's going to be all wonky. So uh, a good way to get around that is just setting your geometry to your origin, um, which is just right right click on it and then set origin, geometry to origin, and then Control A, set all your transforms, and you're good. You can do that in export now too. Oh, you can't do that in export? Yeah, there's a checkbox for uh, apply transforms. That's so cool. They used to do that. I had to re-export stuff so many times to learn that. I, I did it, like, every time I tried to do something, I forget one step in the process. Uh, I guess we're going to call this Iceberg Mene. The documents folder you go. All right. Uh, in this Hollow Play Studio. Yep, and then you can just expand that box to kind of pull that corner down to the frog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you don't cover the banner. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So, file import. How do I do this? Uh, it's a drag and drop, I think. It's drag and drop? Okay, yep. So I just open it in File Explorer? Yep. Video and video. Yeah, we weren't quite sure what to do. I think. Unrecognized extension. All right, I'll try it again. That seemed to work. Maybe. After processing it, this might also be a situation where we use that model importer. Right. Where is that at? Uh, I think it should be one of the most recent used applications on the machine. If you just want to uh, type importer in there. I can't imagine we have too many things named that. And here's where you can totally take advantage of your multiple displays because it takes over a display. Uh, is, this, is this listed on one of these or do I have to add it? Um, Just try drag and dropping into it first. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, you can do videos in it. You can do animated, specifically, you can do animated models too. Um, videos don't automatically have depth data to them, um, but you can add depth data, essentially make an AI go through and look at how far things are from each other. I've seen some very good action scenes for movies that have had depth data added, and it feels like you're right in the room during the fight scene. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. How yeah. do you uh, move this over to the display? Um, try, uh, like, Alt-Tab and moving, just dragging that. Oh, uh, close hollow play. Yeah, you only need you can only have the model importer exporter open because Hollow Play like is ahead of it in the stack of yep. Oh, I see. Okay, there we go. Zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Actually, I might be able to get a spot that's glareless, and you can move it. Oh, ho, 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 ho. That okay. is, that's a hologram. Yeah. I mean, if you move it around a little bit more, it's probably easier to see. I, let me angle it so it's got a good depth there. And then you can see how it's, you're getting sort of the flat view there. And then as you move across, you get that side view with the more depth given to it. I'll look at it with my own two eyes. And you'll notice that there's like very obvious squares on here. Um, I can go back and fix that. Another thing that oh, is that the subdivide? That's not the subdivide, it's just smoothing out. So whenever you have um, uh, geometry, usually it's the shading is either flat or smooth. 
flat shading is uh, shades each individual face um, uh, its own sh uh, lighting amount based on like what's calculated from the engine. Uh, but then smooth shading will basically say do that and then also run through and say what's the average light value for like all these surrounding ones to kind of have a smoother uh, shading so it looks more realistic. If we can, I can show you what that looks like in Blender if we want it, if we're good, are we done with this? Yeah, what are we at, like just after the hour? I'd say let's rip through and do another one of these. All right. Um, for this one, maybe let's let's really make use of that boolean, um, and we'll make another. We'll have the robot make us a material, and we'll start modeling before we even see the material. How about that? All right, all right. Cool. Um, here, let's switch spots again. I'll give you a second off the keys. Thank you for your expertise, Mitchell. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, you're going to be right back in the driver's seat in a second half. Ugh. Grab some water. Yeah. If I can find my water bottle. Hey everybody, I'm back. Um, okay, I'm gonna let the at the very least let the mod get in here. Uh, do you have a uh, suggestion for what we should feed through the robot to draw next, or anyone who's in here with us? Let us know. I'm gonna give you a good 60 seconds to fight the lag here. But I'm gonna pull up that AI machine, a rock. A lot of people don't realize Rock Lobster was actually written by a, a computer. Rock Lobster? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I don't know what Rock Lobster is. You don't know the song Rock Lobster? No. I'm the B 52s I'm uncultured, okay. They're one of those bands that I was shocked when I found out they were American, let alone from Georgia. Like, Wait, they're from Georgia? Yeah. <laughs> they're from Athens, Georgia. A lot of really good bands are from Athens, Georgia. Um, the one that never did not struck me strike me as being from there, but pretty cool. I mean, I guess you got the the Parthenon is like a cool stage show, right? What? The Par oh, the Greek Parthenon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you could, uh, you could yeah. probably set up a concert stage around that. <laughs> so you're uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. There's a recreation of the Parthenon. Oh, that's where that is. I thought that was in Athens, Georgia. No, the University of Georgia is what's in Athens. The, I think it's the frame of that one. Oh, okay. College town. I remember one of the southern kind of, uh, states had like a recreation of the uh, the Parthenon. A rock sitting in the Parthenon. A rock sitting in the Parthenon. Yeah. There we go. That that I sounds. Parthenon, right? I I'm too too paranoid to let this run. Yeah, it looks like it. A rock sitting in the Parthenon. Uh, I'm trying to close out of my OBS window. Um, okay. Let's do a couple of changes to, oh, let this run longer. We'll still get images every 25. Oh, yeah, by the way, you can um, make videos from, uh, yeah, I'm having it do it right now. Oh, it can make AI like videos too. It takes the um, the frames of its iterations. And oh. Makes them, yeah, it takes the iterations and uses them as frames. I see. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, so it's pretty cool to make little like abstract gifs and stuff. I've used it for when I just need something pretty. It doesn't really need to mean much. Um, just fill space. Uh, I'm gonna switch from time to uh, rose water just to give us a different look. What is the impact of time and rosewater? I think water? there are different trainings um, that have just been named with like seasoning names for the sake of like they're not like specifically anything. So how do you just, want your image spiced? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> yeah, one is very cubist. I think oregano is very cubist. Um, time is like pretty photorealistic um, or the closest to it. Oh, yeah, here's another. You'll be interested in this, Mitchell. Um, if I can find my mouse, I've totally lost it right now. Here we go. Um, you can do, robots are weird. So like, uh, you can say things like rendered in Unreal Engine. And because typically when things are rendered in Unreal Engine, they come out pretty high quality and high photorealism, it will make things more photorealistic because it's <laughs> used to that. You can also say like, um, Made with Unity. <laughs> Ghibli. 
Oh, Ghibli. Oh, uh, yeah. That'll and give it a very anime style. So we could make a rock in the Parthenon ten, uh, have five times the weight of being rendered in Unreal Engine or Ghibli. Okay. Now I'm, I'm really interested to see what this is going to look like. Yeah, who knows? It'll just be blurs and <laughs> it'll be underwhelming. Let's go grab an influence just for the sake of helping it out. Uh, let's do you want to grab a nice rock? Might want to grab. Oh, we could grab that. You know, be very meta. We could grab the nanite demo. Um, oh yeah, the yeah. the photo scans they did. What's your opinion on nanite and three D scanning? Um, I mean, not having to care about poly count will make a lot of things possible. Um, it reminds me of when digital art like escaped like really started seeing the benefits of Moore's Law and things not, like, just processing, not hanging. Yeah. Um, the idea that, like, unskilled people are able to, like, create stuff because they don't have to learn, like, all the back tries and polys and things that we think of as, like, fairly, like, core to graphics processing but aren't artistic. They're, like, limitation-based. Yeah. I just, it, I don't really, I'm not a graphics processing engineer, so I don't really know that much about how Nanite's doing what it's doing. But um, just taking those limits away is going to lead to otherwise amazing artists not getting frustrated and throwing their hands up by computer graphics. That's my big hope for it. I'd like to look more into graphics rendering stuff. I, I enjoyed my graphics class that I just had last semester. It seems like the arc is that people who start as being really into the art um, at, often round the corner and become really interested in uh, the underlying technology. You know, you meet a lot of graphics processing people who were studio art people until they just caught the bug and couldn't stop learning about render cycles. Maybe we'll grab something like this. Oh yeah, that's very that's very rock and a Parthenon y. Yeah. And it is rendered in Unreal Engine. It is rendered. I mean, who knows if it'll be because we asked for it or because we told it, like, this is what it should look like. It's going to get multiple um, influences saying that it's uh, Here we can do uh, restart and run all. We don't actually have to run the first set of code. And... We'll see the first image, and then I'm going to let you to it, and I'll have you. I mean, this is, so the exercise Mitchell and I are doing here is very levels of detail, right? Like Oh, yeah, LOD. Yeah. Yeah, so you are working at the first tier, tier of levels of detail, I'd say. Like, you want to do columns? Maybe. That's the furthest detail we should be thinking about. <laughs> so um, I think just something that shows off how Booleans work and stuff. I think it's LOD zero. I actually think levels of detail start at zero for like the highest res stuff. Oh, uh, is it higher? Because you have your start general? and then you always like work down okay. because it's easier to cut away detail than it is to try and add. When I think of levels of detail, I often think of stuff I read in books about Disney animation and I think they use the reverse lingo. Right. Um, I can see that for animation. That makes sense. I think a lot of that goes back to like the... Um, like Snow White and like uh, Sleeping Beauty style like background art, they often I think would obsess on how much detail should be in those. Um, okay, so that's gonna be chewing away. Let's see how far through. I just want to make sure it's at least taken off. Get the first one going. Yeah. I don't know if it's because of the internet connection we have in here or how good this PC is, but that first one ran really fast. Yeah, I remember running the same thing on my computer. It took like my entire shift at it was like yep. three or so hours. Um, I'm gonna close some of these and I'll let you back to it in Blender here. All right. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Blender it is like a way higher aspect ratio its application, so that's why it's screwing with our screen. There you go. All you. Okay. Ugh. I like duet um, visual art stuff like this. I like those like exquisite corpse kind of. You do a couple brush strokes, I'll do a couple thing. Yeah. I think it leads to making interesting weird stuff. Uh, 
so we're modeling some stuff. What what kind of shape are we going for? I guess. We'll start with the cube. Uh, got a basic kind of Parthenon structure here. This is where we're going to do our first uh, modifier. I got myself a column here. I'm going to answer the question in the chat there oh. uh, while you keep modeling, Mitchell. Uh, I think we, what of this company's big uh, like industries that they seem pretty interested in, I totally agree with it in terms of where holograms would have like immediate value return is medicine. Um, if you've read about radiology or what a radiologist day typically looks like, I, I mean those, it's a lot of time staring at 2D monitors um, and it's a lot of looking at pictures that are controlled to look like one another and their expertise, uh, the faster they can understand what they're looking at, the more of them they can make it through every day and the more people they can help. Um, I think 3D visualization, there's already lots of 3D data collection in medicine, uh, and I don't know that there's been a great way to present it all. You've, we've all seen like the slices of a CAT scan or an MRI, um, but that's, you know, those are slices of 3D data, um, but it's a very sort of old school way to be thinking about a, a 3D model to be looking at it in slices. That's something computer graphics kind of abandoned decades ago. Um, and in most part, but these monitors make a lot of sense to be able to look at that, right? So there's a, like a really obvious one there, uh, architecture, landscape architecture, things where you are um, molding large areas. Uh, I think being able to visualize the relationships of things in 3D is pretty useful. Um, even looking at blueprints and extruding them, them up, like you saw uh, Mitchell extruding things earlier, I think that makes oh, yeah. a lot of sense. Um, there's a Plenty of tutorials and stuff online. If you'll see like a, uh, I, there's a GIF on like Twitter that I've seen a million times. It's like someone basically takes a picture of like a building space, for all the windows and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, like in kind of a building, it's got like the like the set ins and the set outs or whatever. But they just take the flat image and then they go from that and divide the mesh and start extruding and pushing in and out. I tried following that tutorial. It's using knife, oh, okay. knife it's tool, knife. I think. Yeah. Um, it, I, man, they are. That's one of those tutorials where. Uh, you realize how skilled the person teaching it is <laughs> based on trying to follow along. But the concept is true. Yeah, the knife tool is amazing for going from 2D to 3D, but they've done a lot of knife tool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think those. Um, also, I, I like if I think about people having these in their home, and I do think that 3D displays are going to be in people's home in a way that like 3D glasses-based TVs are not very appealing to have in your home. Um, Photography, so having a something that's a blend between a photo and a sculpture of your of your you know partner or your grandchildren or whatever. There's a reason people want photos in their homes of loved ones, and having uh, depth in them is pretty cool. Um, I also think about music, and like I don't know, maybe this is me showing my age, but I've spent a lot of time looking at the Winamp visualizer for songs I liked when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And if there are procedural music visualizers, I think them being volumetric is gonna be a major part. Um, I also think cosplay. Um, you're gonna see a lot of holograms within cosplay in the next 24 months. The 
Um, I don't know, you can have a, an actual shown beating heart on your chest, or your Tony Stark costume can have a hologram of the, the ring in the chest, or um, there's lots of things that, be, you know, you want to do a Krang costume, then time has never been better to do a Krang costume. Krang? Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, he's oh, got the head in his right, stomach. Right, right, You right, could right. just stick a hologram on your stomach and you could do that. So, I, I don't know, I, and then I think there's a lot more creative people than me who are going to think of all sorts of ways to use these. I want to play Tetris in one. Oh, in a hologram? Yeah. That would be cool. There's a good free global game jam idea. Free global, if it's... Yeah, feel free to infringe on Tetris's trade. I give you permission to infringe on... I technically, on... I actually, I, I know <laughs> the, um, uh, the theme already. Oh. I'm the site organizer, so it doesn't get released until, to, like, two days from now, but... <laughs> Don't don't leak this on stream. I don't want, 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 want people to watch our Twitch videos. <laughs> I, there would be an interesting. I think you could do a Tetris game for it. It'd be interesting. Though. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm doing the difference here. So this is me using Boolean like, like I did a minute ago. I'm just hollowing out this because I want the four walls sort of. So hollowing that out, then I can delete this middle. That's not what I wanted to delete. There we go. Now I got four walls. Uh, and then I can do the same thing. Let's uh, actually keep this here, this middle guy. This will be our cut. Uh, we'll scale him down like that, and we'll scale him along the y-axis, down some, scale along the z-axis, make it taller so we can kind of get like a door shape here. And then we can kind of, oops, push that through, raise it up. Now I have a nice big, uh, well, maybe a little bit bigger. Give it a grand entrance for Parthenon. All right. So now we're going to take the same one here. We're going to do Boolean, difference again, uh, do that. And get rid of this. Now we have a nice big door. That did not get all the way. This is why you always check to see um, if you didn't done everything right, because what I did there was I applied it, but then I didn't check to see that this empty bottom was there. So now I've gone through and made sure it's all right. Luckily, I can control Z and just get the modifier back. Um, so modifier is what's called non-destructive modeling. So what you do whenever you're modeling is you kind of you're editing the mesh, and what modifier is what you're doing is you're editing the mesh, but you're not actually editing your me the mesh. You're just telling the computer basically from this base mesh, how do I want the mesh to look? Um, so like here, I want this mesh to have a hole in it or something like that based on this other uh, object. And that's useful if you're doing stuff that you're not sure about because it means that if you make a mistake or you change your mind on something, um, you can work backwards with modifiers and you don't have to um, redo a bunch of stuff. It also makes uh, th modeling stuff with high detail a little bit easier because you can do a lot of work in low detail and then just scale the detail up. All right, so I got a very basic Parthon there. So that was a nice speed run Parthon, I got to say. That was, uh, what, that was five minutes? Five minutes of Parthon? Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> what? Uh, the, the other um, big one here that I'm using is the array modifier here. So what this is doing is I have a relative offset. It's just making an array of this, this, uh, this thing. It's just going to keep repeating the mesh. If I tick the count up, it's just going to keep making more columns, ad infinium, until I get tired of it. Um, is that a geometry node feature, or is that just a is, modifier? It's a modifier, but it's technically also a geometry node feature. Geometry nodes do the same thing in a different way, because huh. they're actually messing with like the transform of the, uh, of the thing. Cool. So what this is doing is it's saying, um, uh, I actually did use this modifier a lot for the plants that I made. Because, right. Um, what you can do is, I'll show this off real quick, is uh, if I make an empty, Go.ncsu.edu slash VR plants. VR plants. Open sourced plant education model builder made by Mitchell Dunning. Yeah. You get to mess a lot with your remote modifier in that. All right, so here we go. I have a, a very basic thing here. It's trying to get it in the center of this column here. Uh, there we go. So now if I go in this array modifier here, uh, and I change it from relative offset, so that, that's relative to this object, is what relative offset's doing. Now I'm going to do object offset, and that's going to make it relative to this other object. And so first things first, I need to apply my scale. There we go. 
So this here, if I hit the N key, you'll see I have this transform information. So this has a scale of 1, and this before had a scale of something like that. Uh, so now uh, where I move this is going to determine where all the copies of that other object are going to go. So if I move these out, it's going to move each of these out a little bit. And you'll see this is not perfectly aligned, so these are a little bit off. Um, you'll see they're kind of moving out just a little bit. Um, but that's not important for what we're doing right now. The main thing that's important about object or um, object relevant object offset here is that you can do rotation, which is really useful. So I can do this very cool like rotational. I can get that kind of helix structure, and I can scale it. So if I scale this down, it will scale each one the same amount uh, as it goes on. And I can just kind of uh, move this back some, right? Scale it up a little bit. And then, but then go here and just, you know, keep this and it'll just keep on getting a little bit smaller and you get this really cool helical structure. Now this is more something that you would do with geometry nodes, but it's still possible with something with, um, uh, like the array modifier. It's pretty cool stuff. But for what we needed, we just want relative offset. Say three minutes, then we'll look at the uh, what the robot made for us. I mean, I think we're ready to look at it now. Cool. I'm, I'm pretty much ready. Here. Flip over the stream. We'll all look at it together. Um, if I can get the mouse over there. It is really confusing when you lose track of it. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that is really cool. Yeah, that's probably the first one. And then if you scroll in there, it'll. Yeah. And you can grab any of those if you. Sometimes they'll like start to. What? What? <laughs> the first images in a lot of. Um, in a lot of GANs is pseudo random. Okay. And then it, because it needs like some sort of static to work off of. Gotcha. And so it'll sometimes, like, I think that's a big difference between the flavorings is how it generates its randomness at the beginning. Because then from then it kind of goes into its trained GAN. This, this is cool though. I like this is kind of like it's got the building set into the rocks. Uh, there's like this little creature almost on this. Right here, I like that. Yeah, it's a very flow design, like the random flow. So this is all done. So, cool. Grab it. Save image. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, you can name it something equally uh, abstract as what we did last time. We're gonna call it Rock House. Great. We're gonna spell it the, the pseudo German way. And remember to swap back to Blender on the. Yeah. So you can probably use different sections of that as your material for different stuff if you want yeah, or so whatever you want to do. This is going to be. This would take a little bit too long. We only have about thirty minutes mm -hmm. uh, here. But what we would do at this point is we would do what's called UV unwrapping, and I can do a quick demo of that. Let me uh, go to wireframe here and just join all of that as one object. So now it's no longer seeing that as constituent parts, like constituent cylinders and squares. It's all one mesh, right? Yeah, and so you see all there for a second, uh, if you're watching the stream, that this kind of all formed back into one. That's because I didn't apply this modifier. You've got to make sure you apply your modifiers. Um, and then I can hit Control-J, and that will uh, merge everything together, like, just like that. And then I can hide it all as one object, and so you see up here I only have one object. I'll pull that part on. And we'll call this painting. All right, then we can go here and I can show you UV unwrapping and texturing with our image that we just got before we have to go. So this is a cube. Um, it's a UV unwrap a cube. Uh, it's pretty simple. What we're doing with UV unwrapping is we're trying to take this 3D image, we're going to try and lay it out flat. Um, so if you've ever, like, I'm sure. Most people have had that school activity where you have a little uh, piece of paper and you have to fold up a cube out of it. Uh, and you're just effectively doing the same thing, but in reverse here. So in this cube, there's a couple of cuts we need to do. Uh, for UV unwrapping, luckily, all um, things come previously like UV unwrapped here. So if you'll see here by hit A, uh, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to basically have the bottom face and then uh, the face for each of the sides. And then one of these side faces is going to have the top attached to it so it can all uh, fit together, but whenever you're messing around with models, it doesn't. If you're not if you're not using a primitive like a cube, and you have something a little bit more complicated, you have to cut it by hand or use some of the um, uh, auto cutter tools that Blender gives you. Uh, so I'll give a quick rundown of how to do some of that. So let's manually do all those seams. So you'll see here, this is like where these edges are separated. 
even though technically here they're like the same edge, that's where a seam would be. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through and hit the U key to pull up my UVM wrapping uh, options pack, and I can uh, mark my seam. So I'll mark this in red. U mark seam. U mark seam. This might be easier to do in edge mode. I'm shocked you didn't go into x-ray mode here. Huh? Didn't go into x-ray mode? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely doable to do in x-ray mode. It just doesn't matter, honestly. And so now if I hit U and then I hit unwrap, it'll unwrap what I just did. And uh, you'll see it's a little bit different, but it's the same thing, right? So now all those cuts uh, are shown here. These, this, these two edges here map there. This edge here maps there. This edge, these two edges are this edge here. And these two edges are this edge right here. And then these two here basically don't have, we don't have a cut uh, on this side, which is why this edge here is attached, but this one, uh, this one, and this one are all separate. Um, and then so we get into our texture here. So let's uh, open the texture from our downloads folder. We'll call this one called the Rock House. We got a big texture here. Um, so now if we go into material preview, we got to go back and do what we did earlier and uh, add a new material to this cube and then throw a uh, image texture on the cube. We just search up image, image texture, select from the drop down menu, your, uh, menu our rock house image and plug it into the color because that's all we really need. Um, now you'll see it's kind of like wrapped around the cube in, in weird ways. It doesn't like flatly match up, but it actually does um, if you look at it match up exactly. Uh, to this. So you'll see here, this this little thing here is on this face um, right there. And so we can also um, go into texture painting here. And so I have like a little white, and you'll see that I've kind of been able to uh, like kind of paint on the texture. So I can go. I can do this either in the editor here. I can paint like this, like that, and you'll see it changes here. Or I can paint here, and it'll change on the model. So I can paint like a little five on this side, and you'll see it pops up down there. So I can make like a little, a little uh, dice with this. And as UV maps get more and more complicated for things with increased geometry, the fact that he's able to write on one side of this cube and it just does all the math to where the the line needs to go on the image is magic. Yeah, like yeah, it's it's this, something humans aren't really capable of doing. Being able to write here and not have to figure out where all that is over here is so so much time is saved, especially on something more complicated. Like if I had that Parthenon, on, for instance, uh, if I wanted to say like uh, paint, if I unwrapped it here, I mean we can uh, go ahead and unwrap it. Yeah, let's unwrap the Parthenon, that's pretty interesting. And we'll, we'll get to show off how the uh, thing works, let me go back into This is also how in most video games you've ever played that have simple character faces and expressions, they're able to make everything look as natural as it is. Is so by UV manipulation. What I'm going to do here is go to the UV menu, A, U, V, Smart UV Project, and that's going to basically do it automatically. I'm going to pump this up to like 0.05 or something. And then. Uh, I have never known if they mean for that word to be project or project. I think it's Because both work. <laughs> both make sense contextually. Here we go. So now we see each of these islands here have like a margin between them. And uh, if we go into our material preview. Uh, get rid of your texture painting. Right, right, how do I do that? Uh, I think it's a series of control Z's, honestly. Just gonna undo all the things. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Uh, back to the Parthenon, we're gonna have to do what we did a second again. So, pretty, pretty simple. We'll go to modeling, or you can edit in here. Uh, there we go. Tab A, U, Smart UV Projects. Maybe not 0 0.5, maybe like 0 0.3. Uh, and we have all this stuff mapped out here. We gotta do what we did earlier again. Uh, add a material to this Parthenon, uh, Shift A, Image Texture, click, drag, drop down, texture we want, Rock House, woo! Now it's all mapped on there. We can go to UV Editing here, and we can uh, hit A uh, to select everything, or we can hit uh, L to select uh, single like portions, like this, this uh, column here that I have. Uh, that is going to be all this stuff. So if I want this to all kind of be together here, I can 
Uh, let, let's see, I go at the island select mode here, uh, at the top. So I have vertices select, edge select, face select, and then I have whole island selection. So now I can select this whole island and uh, move it around. And we'll just kind of stack all these up together so it kind of has the same uh, texture on it, wherever it is. That's cool. I've never done that before. Use a texture redundantly like that? Oh, yeah, it's what they, people do all the time. Oh, it's like how old video games got made. Oh, yeah, because yeah. basically you only have so much um, uh, pixel density here in your texture, right? And so, like, say there's some, like, uh, like you have someone with two horns, right? You mm -hmm. would basically just map each, each of the horns to the same texture and then just reverse the, like, orientation of it. Or eyeballs or yeah, yeah, arms or anything points. with character symmetry. You exactly. You animated. only have the texture for, like, one, unless it's, like, someone has, like, a different eye or whatever. Mm -hmm. You only have the texture for one, and then you just overlay everything on it. The Mario 64 Mario model is one of the most interesting models I've ever seen. It has all of his possible expressions um, all baked down to a 512 pixel image. Whoa, 512 pixels? I think it's 512. It might be uh, double 10, that. It might be 1024. I forget. On a 64-bit system, it might be 1024. But it doesn't really matter because he's as met as like as simple in RGB data as he is. Like yeah. they can use all the big, there's like one M in the middle of the material, but otherwise it's all just like swatches of reds and blues and pales. That's the thing that gets me about And then all his little eyes and noses and stuff. Yeah, that's the thing that gets me about like a lot of graphic stuff is that um, like there's so many times where like, especially now that I'm starting to learn like shader code for games where you're really starting to get into the nitty gritty of it all um, to make some cool effects, mm -hmm. like, uh, like you know whatever you want, like lightning or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Um, where you can even abandon having an image, you're just yeah. actually generating the... Like earlier at the beginning of the stream, I did that black and white image for height map information. Like there's there's so much that you can do with like messing around with color channels. Like, okay, I'm going to have this one height map basically be like um, on the blue channel. So how blue this image is is going to tell me how like this place it is. And then how red it is is going to tell me like how uh, rough it is. And how green it is is going to tell me how, uh, how like uh, glossy it is or how shiny or reflective it is. Um, and so you can do a lot of stuff with that, like combining all that RGB data into something. It's really interesting. Crazy. Once uh, computers get good enough that they're packing all of a model's information into one image and it's not human legible even as an image, yeah, I mean, it seems like where it's going. <laughs> Normal apps kind of give me that uh, already, and they're just one facet. Every now and then I'll hit the viewport drop down to show uh, r just roughness or just normal map and be like, oh, that looks better than what I was just working on. I like the color, the colors of normal mapping so much. Yeah. The blues and pinks and everything. Now I can kind of, where do I want? I want to get a wood texture for this yeah. Parthenon, right? So I think so. Kind of move that over yeah, you got kind of that arcane rock work that's sort of interesting and you can take advantage of over there. Where you're I'll heading. try to use some of this like greenery stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with that. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, geo. This is kind of hidden, so it doesn't really matter. Like, you'll, you'll, this is the bottom of it. So Normally in models, actually, what you'll do is this bottom face is like what's inside this other uh, thing here. Like if I uh, edgy and move this up, it's this bottom face there. Uh, normally what you'll do is you'll just delete that face because you don't need to, but we're kind of on a time crunch here, so. Yeah. And our optimization is not going to be that important? Yeah, we don't really mind, so I'm just not worrying about that. And I'm just trying to put everything I have over this, like, wooden kind of slatty. Oh, that worked really well right there. I liked that. Yeah. Uh, just kind of overlaying most stuff over it and kind of get, like, different... Uh, that can add you the, also can animate these things oh that yeah, Mitchell's yeah. doing right now. So if you want to have a billboard that changes between like uh, three different possible billboards, what he just did, movie. yeah, is how you do that effect. It's yeah. pretty cool, yeah. All right, so that that's that top part. And the second uh, section here, we'll do that one. This one can, I think, be a little bit more darker stone like this down here. Kind of yeah. A bit. Yeah. As you get towards the base, you're gonna find some really good, like cobblestone kind of stuff that's going on there. Yeah. So, I mean, this, the kind of the thing you're looking at here is light level as well, because you don't want your um, uh, 
texture to have differences in light level, like this um, uh, bright to shadow, because your rendering engine is already going to shade your uh, model. So you want a very flat like light level. You don't want something to be brighter or darker as you move across, because you're, that's just going to double the effect to whatever you're doing and make it look weird. Um, yeah. So now we got about like two more parts. We got this wall section here. Uh, and that or I'm thinking I really like that section right above my head right now on the Okay, yeah, the, yeah. the wood again right here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I kinda like this like little window a bit too. Oh yeah, yeah, make use of that for sure. If you can position that in a spot where it'll put these all here, put this here. Yeah, there's also that bottom right corner that we haven't really used. The southeast corner of the image this, has this some right cool like yeah, that's the most nanite section. <laughs> Or the demo, not Nanite, that's a rendering technology. Well, I mean, we could do like this and yeah. rotate this like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that'll give like a, a uh, windowed yeah. sort of thing going on. And this kind of has the same, we'll overlay these two because they're the same here. And then we got them, bada boom, bada boom. Alright, there we go. So now you have a kind of like a window. So it doesn't look pretty because we're using an AI generator. Uh, can you make the whole thing rotate? Uh, give it an animation, like a quick just. Uh, in each of these animations? No, nah, just the the whole model itself. Oh, yeah. Just okay, so make that's, it do that's a, very simple. a uh, constant rotate. What we're going to do is we're going to add an armature. So this is going to add a bone. Uh, and then with the bone, we should be able to just uh, parent that to this whole model. So do control P. And then. Uh, This is a 3.0 change, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, don't like, I don't like that. It's all different in junk. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll go into animation. Uh, back to what we do here. Uh, you can see how it's different if we do the rendered. Uh, there we go. And then we're gonna add like a slow light to the scene. Oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah. There you go. Ooh, yeah. Look at that. Go. We've got a nice little wooden button on here. So what we'll do here is we'll go, we'll click on this uh, thing, and I'm actually going to go into viewport display and click the in front box. That means this is all. This bone is always going to be basically rendered on top of whatever we're working on, so you can always see it. Very useful. I just learned something. Um, super, super duper useful. Yep, I did not that. know about that. Um, and we're going to go into uh, our frames here. We're going to go into pose mode with our thing. So now we should be able to pose this. And oh, did I not? What? You're supposed to, OK. I think you might have to give it a pose per frame. No, so if it doesn't have a zero. It should, it should if I'm in pose mode, basically, whenever I move this, it should move whatever it's parenting to. Um, so that means that I need to weight paint this still. Okay. It's not bad. I just need to, I think, click on this and then that, and then do Control P. Yeah. If you want go. to abandon, oh, there you go. Armature yeah. deform uh, with automatic weights, please. And now this moves with it. There we go. So we'll move. We'll start at zero at one frame. We'll uh, hit, go into pose mode. Um, let's see if, that if you want to make the math easier on yourself, make it a 400 frame animation. What the? Okay. Then a, rather than a 250. <laughs> Unless you're really good at dividing 250. I'm not. Because mm. this way you can make it go 90 degrees at each 100 frames. This still isn't working. This is also something that if you want to abandon uh, and just export it so we can get it in the hologram, I'm fine with that too. might need to be in object mode as you do that. No, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to assign this to uh, the vertex group. Oh, should okay. have you're still doing the armature? Yeah, it, sh it should be bone. Yeah, there we go, group. And then if I go into that, there we go. So I hit A, I'm going to assign that to that. And now this is all red, this means that that bone is going to control it. So, look. 
now, we should be able to actually animate it. So I should be able to go to this and go to pose mode, and then if I rotate. If anyone has made it this far into the stream and is interested in rigging, there's an excellent, excellent uh, video series in our Twitch channel in the past where we were rigging a hand in Blender. Um, so feel free to just throw that into our YouTube or Twitch video search bar and you'll find that. Really nice walkthrough on how to do uh, rigging and armatures at a higher depth of detail than what we're using it right now. Okay. I think Isaac might have done that stream. It's still not working. No. <sighs> Abandon that pursuit if you want. Okay. Just yeah, just that. go ahead and export it. <laughs> I've, I know how to do this. I've done this before. I yeah, see. no, it's uh, getting Blender armatures set up. Yeah, you can do it 100 time. times, and it'll still throw you off sometimes. All right, so we're going to export this to GLB. Let's, let's do what we did earlier. Let's yep. make sure we apply our uh, transforms. Well, actually, let's, you said that we had uh, transforms in. Um, yeah, I think you do. I think it's a checkbox under let's GLB try that export. Out. So, transform? Uh, yep. Uh, I wonder if this is another thing I've added an add on that does it. I have a special DLTF GLB uh, exporter gotcha. loaded into my Blender. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. So, that's good to know that's not a 3.0 thing, that's an add on thing. Scale, rotation. Now that would be all sets. Get rid of that. All right. File, export, GLB. And we'll do this is the rock house. Uh, to brag about how cool Blender is for anybody who doesn't care about holograms, uh, there's also add ons that let you uh, print your object that, from Blender to printer paper. And then the you just cut the paper out and fold it, and it creates a 3D version of the model you just made. Um, so somebody was asking earlier where we see this holograms getting used. Uh, that's a great example of how Blender is going to eat everything. Okay, so we have there we go. Oh yeah, we don't need it animated because you can control it over there. Yeah. Da, 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 da. See here, this uh, this wall is uh, got the same pattern repeated. That's because we overlaid it over the same section. Um, you kind of have this. This is like a mirrored version of the same thing. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's good to understand how like UVs and everything have an impact on all that. There you go. That's a cool apartment on that model. Hope you all enjoy it. Nice. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up. So uh, just to reiterate the really useful information in here, uh, this equipment you've seen us working with today, everything you've seen us touch today, uh, I don't think there's been a single piece of equipment that would not be available to you with just a regular reservation within the D.H. Hill Jr. VR studio, um, including uh, until they're in tech lending, you're uh, welcome to just walk up and grab one of these holograms and the studio attendant will help you uh, help you set it up and help you grab it from the locker and everything. Uh, and obviously we have Blender on every one of our workstations in that studio because it's a great piece of free and open source software. Um, we'll be back here streaming VR content throughout the semester. You'll see Mitchell's uh, face there on stream quite a bit. Yep. Um, and we'll, we're obviously available to help you with any of these kinds of projects in the VR studio as well. Uh, feel free to reach out through our technology consultation or via email. Uh, you can find me at go.ncsu.edu slash Colin, spelled just like at the bottom of your screen right now. Um, I've had a really good time. Thanks for being with me, Mitchell. Yeah, thanks, um, for, having me, yeah, thanks for all your Blender skills. And uh, we will see everybody next time. Uh, yeah, have a safe week with the winter weather coming. Yep. Yep. Bye, everybody.